politician lie well, every time they open their mouth. This is the state of our politics today, where we openly expect our politicians to lie and are resigned to the fact that they will lie. And what's more, we rarely hold them accountable when they do lie. We re-elect liars, even the ones we know intentionally lie. But it's not just our politics where people lie. It's in relationships with our friends, our girlfriends, our boyfriends, our spouses. It's at work, play, and it's sadly in the church. But lying is in this world shouldn't surprise us. For Jesus said in John 8, 44, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil lied from the beginning of time, and he will lie until the end of time. And unfortunately, mankind will continue to be <laughs> fooled by his lies, and will continue to lie if we feel justified in doing so. Now, even though we know what the Bible says on lying, something we will cover a little later, do we really understand what lying is? If you were to look it up in the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, you would find that the top definition would be to make an untrue statement <laughs> with the intent to deceive. Another definition you would find is to create a false or misleading impression. So the way the world defines lying has to do mainly with someone's intent. Yes, it deals with false statements, but it has to do with your intent in telling. And while that last statement is true, that it is, if you tell something untrue and know it to be untrue, that that is lying, we must be careful that we do not take a 21st century thinking and automatically assume that that is God's definition as well. We must look to scripture to find out what is meant by lying. If we did this, we would find that the word lying is translated from several Greek words. In Ephesians 4.25, for instance, lying is translated from the Greek word pseudos, which simply means falsehood. We use that word today. Pseudonym is a false name. Pseudoscience, false science. Uh, all of those come from Greek and Latin phrases. So pseudos means falsehood, and that's used that way in Ephesians 4.29. In Colossians 3, verse 9, the word lie is translated from the Greek word pseudomehi, which means to utter an untruth or attempt to deceive by lying. In fact, I looked up all the Greek variations that are in my Bible program that are translated as lying in the Bible. And they all carry the same meaning to the two I just mentioned that are on the screen. They're just used in different contexts and they, use, they look like different words, but they're all the same sort of word. So is there any difference between the Bible definition of lying and how people view lying today? And the answer to that is yes. Almost all modern definitions of lying only call something a lie when we know that it is a lie and we tell it anyway. The Bible calls something a lie when it is untrue no matter of intent or prior knowledge. I only found one definition in the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary that would explicitly define lying that way. So it does exist in the dictionary. The entry says an untrue or inaccurate statement that may or may not be believed as true by the speaker or writer. It should not surprise us that our society views lying in this cavalier or loosely defined way, for as we discussed briefly last week, many believe that there is no such thing as objective or actual truth. Truth is relative and is based on your beliefs. Therefore, lying is also relative based on what you believe to be true. The Bible says otherwise. 
Either something is true or it is false. It doesn't matter if we believe it to be true or not. If something is not true, it is a lie. 1 John 1, 21 says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Now, do you mean that someone will be accountable for saying something that is not true, even though they believed it to be true? Well, they will be held accountable in a different way, but yes, they will still be held accountable. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verses 36 to 30 and 37, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Unintentionally lying is not the same as intentionally lying. But it is still not speaking the truth, and therefore it is lying. It's the same as unintentionally stealing. Stealing is taking something that does not belong to me. Now, if I un unintentionally stole something, like an office pen, or if I intentionally stole something, like $100, it doesn't matter, because stealing is stealing. Knowing this, we should therefore be careful that what we're actually saying, we know to be true. But in the event that we unintentionally lie, or in ignorance lie, how do we deal with those types of lies. The same way we deal with intentional sins, by praying to God for forgiveness. First John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sometimes I don't think we have a full appreciation for what the word all means. <clears throat> all is a three-letter word and it means everything. So when we confess our sins, God is able to forgive us from all unrighteousness. And you say, well, how do I know how to confess a sin that I don't know of? Well, if you listen to most of the prayers that are led here in the congregation, if the speakers have forgive us of our sins in some way, shape, or form. Now, is that if that is just an empty phrase, we should not be saying it. But when someone prays, forgive us of our sins, he doesn't know what Naomi's sin, or Jeff's sin, or John's sin, or my sin is. But we're still praying for God to forgive us of our sins. <clears throat> if God won't forgive us of our sins that way, we need to stop praying that. If God expects us to come along and say, you got to tell, you got to confess every sin of lying, every sin of thinking about something you shouldn't, then there's going to be a lot of sins we leave out. Now, if we know something that we have done is wrong, we should confess it. We should repent of it and confess it. We know when we lie, when we intentionally lie. We know when we have intentionally deceived someone or stolen someone or looked on someone that we shouldn't have. We know that. We are to confess the sins we know of. But the ones we don't know of, we are to confess those as well and if you think you don't have any sins you don't know of, verse 10 of 1 John 1 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. A Christian does not seek to sin, but understands that we do. And therefore, to pray for forgiveness, knowing that Jesus paid the price for sin on the cross already, and therefore we need to trust that God will forgive us of each and every sin we commit. Let's not minimize lying, for the Bible doesn't. As is illustrated in the story that we're about to study, if you were to turn in your book, in your Bible, sorry, in your Bibles, to 2 Samuel chapter 1. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Last time we were in the Old Testament, we found King Saul disobeying the words of the Lord by not utterly destroying the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15. The people kept, remember the fatlings of the flock, and Saul kept King Agag as a prize. <clears throat> when Samuel came to confront Saul, Saul said that he had obeyed the word of the Lord. But when Samuel said, "What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears?" and then God told and then told him that God would run the kingdom from him, only then did Saul confess his sin. <clears throat> what we're actually going to find today is that some of the Amalekites that Saul said he utterly destroyed obviously had escaped because the man we're going to read of is an Amalekite. 
And David had just come from slaughtering the Amalekites. So that shows us again that Saul didn't obey the word of the Lord, and neither did the people. After 1 Samuel 15, Saul slowly digresses into further sin, and he walks farther and farther away from God. David, the son of Jesse, was anointed king over Israel, but was not crowned king until after the death of Saul. Saul, angry with David, and seeing him as a threat to the throne, sought to kill him. But at the same, but time and time again, David escaped Saul, for the Lord was with him. The end of 1 Samuel, we have recorded for us the death of Saul during the battle with the Philistines. 2 Samuel begins directly where, where 1 Samuel left off. So with that quick review, let's read 2 Samuel 1, verses 1 through 16. <clears throat> now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziklag, on the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. That means he bowed himself. And David said to him, Where have you come from? So he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, How did the matter go? Please tell me. And he answered, The people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead? And the young man who told him said, As I happened by chance to be on Mount Geboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear, and indeed the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? So I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said to me again, Please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live uh, He could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Therefore David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and Jonathan his son, for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Then David said to the young man who told him, where, where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. So David said to him, how was it you were not afraid to put your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. So David said to him, your blood is on your own head, for your mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Now David was involved not in this battle with the Philistines that killed Saul. He was slaughtering the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were actually down here in the map. I could not get a full map to be on the screen to show it all. That would make Israel, which is this section right here, which is actually pretty small. We wouldn't be able to see any of the detail of Israel. But what we would call Saudi Arabia is where, in northern Saudi Arabia anyway, is where the Amalekites are found. We will get more into that in our study of Exodus in our podcast, because the Israelites, when they come out of Egypt, will face the Amalekites, which of course was the background to the story as to why God wanted them killed. But anyway, David was down here uh, killing the Amalekites. Saul was up in northern Israel. Uh, this is a newer map, so it, it, he's up here in northern Israel at Mount Jubala. That is, uh, if you want to know where it is in relation to the tribes, Issachar and Matt, West Manasseh. That's where those two tribes meet in the Jezreel Valley. But Saul's up here and this is where Saul dies. Now we read that David, he was in Ziklag. He was down here. There's Beersheba, here's Jerusalem, there's Jericho. And down here is Ziklag, and he's near the, Phil the Philistines, the land of the Philistines. So that's where David is. And so we have this man coming. He came all the way. If I can get my thing to work. He came all the way from Mount Gilboa all the way down to Ziklag. If you wanted to know, Nazareth is right up here, and there's the Sea of Galilee. So he came up quite a long way, and we know that this is, if you take a look at the map, you can see the details. Pretty mountainous region right here. But he came to see David, and he bowed himself to David. Now, David didn't know why this man did this, so he asked him, 
where he came from. The man replied he had escaped the camp of Israel. Now David was curious as to how the battle went, because of course he wasn't up there. To which the man replied, the people have fled from battle. Many are dead, including Saul and Jonathan. The death of Saul was going to change David's life immediately. And the death of his best friend Jonathan, as well, would bring immense sorrow to David. So David wanted to know how this man knew this. Had he heard it from someone, or did he witness it himself? How the man answered would affect whether or not David would right away believe that this message was true. So the man said he happened by chance to be coming to Mount Gilboa. When he saw Saul, he was leaning on his spear. Saul was gravely injured. Now when Saul saw him, Saul asked him who he was, and the man responded that he was an Amalekite. Saul then requested that the man kill him, for he was in great pain, yet he was still alive. We would call this a mercy killing today. Euthanasia is another term we might call it. And kill Saul is exactly what this man said he did. To prove to David that that was true, he gave David Saul's crown and Saul's bracelet. That was proof. David was extremely grieved at the news, so much so that he tore his clothes, as did all that were with him. That is a sign of grief. We don't do that today, but that is a sign of grief back then. Now, Jonathan was a righteous man. So we might expect such a reaction upon hearing of Jonathan's death. But the passage also said that David tore his clothes at the word of Saul's death too. He mourned for Saul just as he mourned for Jonathan. Now why would David do this? Because Saul was God's anointed. And so whether good or evil, David was still subject to the Lord's anointed and would be saddened by his death. We should not take delight in the death of anybody no matter how bad they are, because once you die, you are past the point of no return. Saul was past the point of no return. No chance of repenting and coming back to God anymore. Another reason for David to mourn. After they finished mourning that day, David asked the man where he was from. Now, the man responded that he was an alien, meaning he was his father had immigrated to Israel. He was an Amalekite as well. David then asked, how then, since he lived in Israel, were you not afraid to strike down the Lord's anointed? Now the Amalekites, including this one, knew who Saul was, for Saul had come against them many years before and killed many of them. This man also knew, because he lived in Israel, that Saul was the king of Israel, and since he knew that, he knew he was God's anointed as well and should therefore be respected. <coughs> now yes, the man said that Saul asked him to kill him. But even this saying didn't justify the man killing Saul. Murder is murder, no matter if we do it in cold blood or as an act of what we might call mercy. The Amalekite wasn't in battle with Saul, and so he had no right to kill him. Knowing this, David commanded the man to be executed for killing Saul, the Lord's anointed. Now you might be wondering, well, we're supposed to be talking about lying. And the title of this sermon is The Lie That Cost a Man His Life. What did this man lie about? For that, we need to turn back one page in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 31. 1 Samuel 31, let's start reading at verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, Mal Mal Malchikusha, I had it yesterday, but... Those were Saul's sons. Uh, the battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. Now this chapter paints a very different picture of Saul's death, which is the reason that some skeptics come along and say, there's a contradiction here. It's only two chapters apart. It's really only a couple paragraphs apart if you were to read it together. How could the Bible get it wrong so quickly? 
about. We'll discuss that in a second. In the first story, we have Saul committing suicide. In the man's story, we said, the man said, he killed him. These are two completely different stories. You can't come along and say, well, this is just a different way of telling the same story. We often try to do that. This is just another eyewitness account. You can't do that. The, he, Saul either committed suicide or he was murdered. Now, which one is true? Well, 1 Samuel 31 is told as a narrative. It's not told by an, an eyewitness. It is told as a narrative. And so under the direction of the Holy Spirit, whoever is writing this, for Samuel is dead by this point, they tell us actually what happened. The story found in 2 Samuel 1 was told by this man who was supposedly telling us what happened. In other words, the Bible presented to us what the man actually said. If it hadn't, but it told us what had actually happened to Saul, and then recorded that David killed this man, what justification would there have been for David to act in this way? No, the Bible presents it to us just as the man had said, which means that he lied. It is very unlikely that the man ever saw what actually happened. Otherwise, why wasn't he killed as well? Saul's armor bearer was, Saul's three sons was, or worse, Saul was. This man was there, why wasn't he killed? He therefore likely found Saul's body before the Philistines did, and he stripped it of the crown and the bracelet, and then likely ran and ran into someone who filled him in on some of the details. Instead of having Saul commit suicide, though, the man said he killed Saul, likely because he thought that by doing so, he would get into David's good graces. For after all, David was a mighty man and the next king of Israel. Add to that that Saul was out to kill David, and the man probably thought it would be good for him to be known by David as the one who killed Saul. Who knows, maybe there would be a prominent place for him in David's kingdom. This, this lie, though, cost him his life. For nobody had the right to kill the Lord's anointed, not even David, the one who would be the next king of Israel. The man didn't need to lie here, but he did, and he paid for it with his life. And David was justified in killing the man here, for if either he actually did kill Saul, which was a capital offense, or he lied about killing Saul, which was equally wrong. Either way, the man deserved death, not the praise of the king of Israel. So with that, what can we learn from this story? First of all, we can learn that lying is condemned in all situations. Colossians 3, verse 9, we read, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. The old man is the man of sin. The unsaved man. Christians are not to lie to one another because they are no longer to walk according to the flesh. But what if lying it, we lie to protect a person's feelings? We're not to lie. But what if the lie is about something that's not really that big or that important? We're not to lie. There's no wiggle room in Colossians 3 verse 9 that says lying is okay in some situations. What part of do not lie is hard to understand? But doesn't the Bible contain places where people lie? Well, we read of one. But there are many other places where we find people lie. But those lies are never celebrated by God as something that was good. In Romans 3, verses 7 and 8, we read, For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? As we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. In that passage, Paul asked the question, if someone's lie actually had the effect of increasing the truth of God, why then does God condemn that person as a sinner for lying in that case, even though the truth of God may be increased? Shouldn't he be celebrated because the truth of God has increased? And so instead of condemning this liar, shouldn't we be teaching that, well, if we do evil and good comes from it, that therefore doing evil was okay? The answer to that is no. And those who slanderously accused Paul of teaching such a doctrine deserve the condemnation they would receive. 
the ends don't justify the means if the means includes sin. Lying is never celebrated in the Bible. In fact, it often is shown to lead to more problems. This man died because he lied. Other people have other big problems happen because they lie. All the Bible does is show men and women as they are. And the Bible shows them as sinners in need of a Savior, Jesus, just like we do. If we choose to lie, let it be known that we are sinning. And if those lies are unforgiven, we deserve punishment. Now what is that punishment? For that, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21 and read verses 6 to 8. Revelation 21, beginning at verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the, the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He will overcome, shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This passage contains a precious promise, eternal life to the faithful. But it also contains a warning. Cowardly people, people who will not stand up for Christ. I'm not talking about people who are afraid of spiders. Uh, people who will not stand up for Christ. Cowardly people, unbelieving people, abominable people, murderous people, sexually immoral people, people who practice sorcery and idolatry, as well as all liars will be punished in hell. Now we can understand murderers, idolaters, sexually immoral, abominable people getting punished. But liars? Yes. Because of that, we should come to terms with the fact of how God views lying, and he views it seriously. We tend to classify lying into little white lies that don't hurt anybody, and big black lies that intend to deceive defraud or slander the character of another person. Those big liars, now they deserve to be punished, but not those little liars, right? No, Revelation 21 says all liars. If we have been left unforgiven by God of the lies that we've told, we know what awaits us, and it won't be desirable to say the least, or it will be eternal separation from God, from God in hell. So. If we're not to lie, what are we to do? In Ephesians 4, verse 25, Paul writes, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For, if we, for we are all members of one another. We're to speak the truth with our neighbor. Telling the truth is hard. For it means not saying the first thing that comes to your head. It means that we need to think before we speak. And it means that we need to know the facts before we speak. But telling the truth is possible, otherwise Paul would have said so here in this verse. God doesn't expect the impossible of us. If it was not possible to worship him in spirit and in truth, then he wouldn't ask it. If it wasn't possible not to commit fornication, then he wouldn't ask it. Likewise, if it was not possible to tell the truth, he wouldn't ask it. But it is possible. In James 4, you would turn there. James 4, we're going to start reading at verse 2. James 4, beginning at verse 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. Now from reading this passage through quickly, 
It at first appears that James contradicts my thoughts by saying that it is impossible to control the tongue. But that's not what he said. It's impossible to tame the tongue. A dog who is tamed and well behaved does not need to be on a leash or have a muzzle on because it is tame. It will not bite someone else and it will not run away if it has been properly tamed and trained. We will never get to the point in our lives where we can let our tongue off the leash and not have to worry about what we say. Or our tongue can get us into trouble in an instant. People bless God and curse people with the same tongue. James said that not, that ought not to be. The same is true with lying. We should not lie. We should tell the truth always. But what happens when and if we do lie? We're to repent of our sins, confess them to God, and correct our mistakes. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, we read, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. When we sin, no matter what that sin is, we're to repent of it, confess our sins to God, and then correct whatever needs correcting in our lives. When it comes to lying, if at all possible, we need to set the record straight with the ones we've lied to. That will be difficult. It will require humility. And sometimes might even get us into bigger trouble than we were already in in the first place. But the fruits of repentance will be known by what we do after we sin. Repentance is not simply saying sorry. That's what the world does, and then it goes back to walking in sin again. Repentance is feeling sorrow for sin, but then correcting that sin in our lives so that we determine no longer to walk in it. When it comes to lying, that is a hard task. And it will require much discipline. And we will fall along the way. But if we walk in the footsteps of God and grow closer to Him, we will find that it becomes easier and easier. For God alone can make us stand forgiven by His grace. So what I hope you take away from this morning's lesson is the seriousness of lying. A man in David's time told a lie that cost him his life. May it not be so with us. Let's strive to always tell the truth, to build a reputation as one who tells the truth so that we can go out and teach the gospel. If we fail to do this, if we are known as a liar in worldly things, someone lost in sin is not going to believe us when it comes to salvation in Christ, or needing to be baptized, or anything else. We will, have helped, we will have helped to doom a soul to hell by our lack of honesty in all things. Let's therefore go out this week seeking to tell the truth in all situations. And if we fall short, repent and pray to God for forgiveness and correct the wrongs before others. Let's be the type of Christians that God desires of us. That city set on a hill that cannot be hit. I'm not ashamed.